good job. <laughs> All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison, and I often use anger as a way to control and manipulate others. <laughs> I'm also very petty and backbiting and vindictive and impatient, judgmental and selfish. <laughs> now these are just a few of my sinful behaviors. Um, at least these are the ones that I'm really dealing with right now. A few years ago, it would have been a different list. Uh, but why am I telling you all this? Maybe you recognize this way of speaking. It became popular in the groups of AA, um, where people just came right out and told the truth about themselves, right? So I want to talk to you today about a biblical principle called boasting in our weaknesses. And believe it or not, the Bible actually celebrates when we boast in our weakness. Now, I'm not saying that it celebrates sin, but it celebrates when we're honest and transparent about our weaknesses um, rather than trying to hide them. And uh, it's at this moment when we really start to be honest where we actually begin to encounter God. All right. So first I'm going to start and read a passage um, in uh, 2 Corinthians. It's in, starting in chapter 11. And uh, this is written by the Apostle Paul. I'm sure you've heard of him. So um, in this passage, he is actually confronting... Uh, they had some false teachers coming into the church and they were basically boasting about how they've had all these amazing spiritual experiences with God. And they were using that to try and gain credibility with the people in Corinth. Um, and they were trying to use that to steer them away from uh, Christ and the fall and teachings of Christ. So Paul is confronting um, these teachers, and this is his response. So it's going to be 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, starting in verse 30. You can use the Bibles in front of you if you'd like to go there. Let's see here. Uh, in this one, it's 955. This Bible, 955. All right, let's see here. If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be praised forever, knows I tell the truth. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Artis kept guards at the city gates to catch me but I was lowered in a basket through a window in the city wall, and that's how I got away. This boasting is all so foolish, but let me go on. Let me tell about the visions and revelations I received from the Lord. I was caught up into the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether, by, whether my body was there or just my spirit, I don't know. Only God knows. But I do know that I was caught up into paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be told. That experience is something worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I am going to boast only about my weaknesses. I have plenty to boast about and would be no fool in doing it because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it. I don't want anyone to think more highly of me than what they can actually see in my life and my message, even though I have received wonderful revelations from God. But to keep me from getting puffed up, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from getting proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace, my gracious favor is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may work through me. Since I know it, it, it is all for Christ's good, 
I am quite content with my weaknesses and with insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay. <clears throat> so Paul's expressing in this passage that he could focus on all the amazing things that he's experienced with God and all the uh, things that he's accomplished for God. But he says, that's foolishness. It's foolishness to boast in those things. And what he rather wants to focus on is what his weaknesses are, because he says that is the place that he experiences strength and power and grace from Christ. And Paul describes the situation of a thorn in his flesh, and he calls it a messenger of Satan to torment him. And he says that he asked God to take it away, but God didn't. Instead, God allowed him to continue to experience this suffering in order to address his pride. So we can't know for certain what this thorn was, but we know that it was something Paul couldn't fix. It was something that was unmanageable to him in his life. And we can all relate to that because we all have experiences in our lives that we can't fix, right? Um, something that, that, that no matter how much energy or effort we put towards it, nothing seems to change. And so often we grow in our despair in these situations rather than seeing them as an opportunity to encounter God. I was recently listening to a podcast and the host uh, quoted this. He said, the genius of this 12-step program, that is steps, programs like AA, is the celebration of personal inadequacy. When we admit our failures publicly, it is seen as a spiritual achievement. Another uh, author, Dallas Willard, quoted this. He said, God's address is at the end of my rope dot com. <laughs> so I'm going to read for you a story uh, about a man named Fred, and this story comes out of the big book of AA. And he's going to demonstrate for us this concept, this principle. I'm going to skip over a few parts just for time's sake. But <clears throat> Fred is a partner in a well-known accounting firm. His income is good. He has a fine home, is happily married, and the father of promising children of college age. He has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. If ever there was a successful businessman, it is Fred. To all appearance, he is a stable, well-balanced individual. Yet, he is alcoholic. We first saw Fred about a year ago in the hospital where he had gone to recover from a bad case of jitters. It was his first experience of this kind, and he was much ashamed of it. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. The doctor intimidated strongly that he might be worse than he realized. For a few days, he was depressed about his condition. He made up his mind to quit drinking altogether. It never occurred to him that perhaps he could not do so in spite of his character and standing. Fred would not believe himself an alcoholic, much less accept a spiritual remedy for his problem. We told him what we knew about alcoholism. He was interested and conceded that he had some of the symptoms, but he was a long way from admitting that he could do nothing about it. He was positive that this humiliating experience, plus the knowledge he had acquired, would keep him sober for the rest of his life. Self-knowledge would fix it. We heard no more of Fred for a while. One day, we were told that he was back in the hospital. This time, he was quite shaky. He soon indicated that he was anxious to see us. The story he told was most instructive, for here was a chap absolutely convinced he had to stop drinking, who had no excuse for drinking 
who exhibited splendid judgment and determination in all other concerns, yet was flat on his back nonetheless. Let him tell you about it. I was much impressed with what you fellows said about alcoholism, and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. I rather appreciated your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink, but I was confident it could not happen to me after what I had learned. I reasoned I was not so far advanced as most of you fellows, that I had been usually successful in licking my other personal problems and that I would therefore be successful where other men had failed. I felt I had every right to be self-confident, that it would only be a matter of exercising my willpower and keeping on guard. I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a few cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. I ordered a cocktail in my meal, then I ordered another cocktail. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be a fine before going to bed, so I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night and plenty next morning. I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxicab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days. I know little of where I went, what I said or, and did. Then I came to the hospital with unbearable mental and physical suffering. As soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, I made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time, I had not thought of the consequences at all. I knew from that moment that I had an alcoholic mind. I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. I had never been able to understand people who had said that a problem had, been had had them hopelessly defeated. I knew then, and it was a crushing blow. So uh, in this story, Fred goes on to accept the spiritual program of AA and does get free of alcohol and encounters God. Um, now, to be fair, uh, most of us don't necessarily have an extreme in addiction like Fred had. Um, however, there are a lot of similarities between us and Fred. So I want, to notice, want you to notice first off that Fred functioned very well in many of the other areas of his life, right? He said he had a good home, sex, successful business, uh, good, you know, uh, his kids were doing well. And so he was successful in many of the world's standards in most of the areas of his life. In fact, he had all these strengths, and those strengths allowed him to kind of downplay and minimize his struggles with alcohol. And he thought to himself that because he could help himself in all these other areas of his life, he didn't need help with alcohol, and that his willpower alone would be able to change it. And we also do this in our lives, right? Instead of really admitting that we're defeated in certain areas of our lives, we try to minimize that, um, and we try to focus on all the things that we're doing right, right? And this is, this is completely a counterintuitive idea that we would boast in our weaknesses, right? Or, or, or boast in our failures. Everything in the world tells us to do the opposite. But like Fred, we all have things in our lives that no matter how hard we try, they are completely outside of our control. But what Fred didn't realize at that time was that his problem with alcohol was actually an opportunity for him to encounter and meet God. And we also often don't realize that our frailties, our weaknesses, our struggles are places where we can meet God. The first step of the AA 12-step uh, process is we admitted that we were powerless over blank, whatever that is for you, 
and that our lives had become unmanageable. So when we start by admitting our powerlessness in certain situations of our lives, that is actually where our freedom begins. So why don't we do this? Why don't we admit that readily? We hide these things in our lives because they bring up enormous shame in our, in our hearts because we fear being exposed and we fear rejection from other people. So we keep these things hidden. But this is exactly what makes the kingdom of God the upside down kingdom. Because in the kingdom of God, we don't have to hide anymore. We're finally free to be really honest about who we are and reveal ourselves and not receive judgment. Jesus embraced weakness. He embraced the weakness and the shame of being on the cross. And he didn't use his strength to save himself. He embraced the limitations and weaknesses of being a human and he waited for the Father to save him. And he did all of that so that we could be free of the shame of our weaknesses. And he did it to show us the path that we have to walk in order to experience freedom and wholeness. So the church, the body of Christ, is actually meant to be a place where we can come together and celebrate our weaknesses together, and we can celebrate the one who is our strength together. So um, Jesus comes and says to each one of us, no matter where we're at on the journey, as long as we are humbly admitting over and over again where we're weak, he says to us, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So we have to ask the question, where in my life are things unmanageable, right? Where are you experiencing this? Is it a relationship, maybe a health problem, a serious loss that you've experienced, a financial issue? Maybe it's a sin pattern that you just keep, you can't seem to overcome. Or insecurities, fear, uh, anxiety, anger. What, what is the area in your life that you, no matter how much time and energy that you fight and try to change it, it just stays the same? What is the situation that just makes you feel hopeless? Right? What, is, what is this area in life for you? I want us to spend some time thinking about that today. Um, one of the practices that I do regularly is especially when I'm feeling a lot of this shame and inadequacy and sense that I don't have what it takes. Uh, I imagine myself sitting with Jesus and I basically present all of it to him. I, I let him know all of it and I just say, Lord, this is where I'm a failure today. And I give it to him like I'm giving him an offering. Because oftentimes, the only thing that we really do have to offer to God is our weaknesses. And what always surprises me when I do this exercise is that I experience God offering me forgiveness and restoration and grace. I don't experience him saying, I'm so disappointed with you and, you know, you're such a failure. I can't believe you messed up again. And I don't experience him being angry at me or even indifferent. I experience just this, this embrace from him in that place of weakness. And he tells me over and over again, I'm going to keep walking this out with you. I'm not going to abandon you along this journey. I'm with you through this. So, um, we're going to do an exercise today like this one. So while we're doing that, I'd like a couple of things. One, Adam, would you mind just coming up and just playing sort of softly? Um, and then if some people could come pray up, up, up to be prayers. Anyone who is willing to pray, if you could come up to pray. Um, so we're going to spend about five, seven minutes doing this exercise. 
So I want you to do that same thing. I want you to, to imagine those things in your lives that are serious weaknesses or, or situations, circumstances that are just out of your control and they feel like no matter what you do, you can't win. And I want you to imagine Jesus is with you and I want you to present those things to him and allow him to receive that from you and allow him to respond to that in you. And then after we do that, if you need prayer, if you want more prayer, um, we're gonna be up here available to pray for you. And then we're gonna take communion together, okay? All right. I just want to invite anyone who needs prayer to go ahead and come on up and receive prayer. And while we're, um, you're receiving prayer, we're also going to go ahead and take communion now. And, you know, communion is this place where we, again, bring all those weaknesses and receive 
the strength that Christ has for us and his grace for us. So whenever you're ready, you can just come on up and, and receive it. Mm -hmm. 